So two years ago, I started feeling that life was getting a little monotonous. I had been putting off artistic projects and ideas for quite some time and finally just decided to do something about it. So first, I started drawing my daily four-panel comic blog. Doing that, I couldn't make excuses for not knowing what it was that I was going to write about because I was writing about my own day. Then I turned my cartoon blog website into a podcast, the one that you're listening to right now. It was a way to connect with other artists. So I took a risk and I set up an ad on Facebook that showed to anyone who was an artist within a 10 mile radius of my own home. In the ad itself, all it said was, are you an artist? A new podcast wants to talk to you. And then I spoke with the first 12 people that responded and that became the first season of this show. Here's the thing though. I wasn't too daring that first time around because even though everybody I spoke to lived near me, I interviewed them over the internet on a video chat. Some of them even said to me, we could have just met somewhere to do it. So the season after that, and by the way, when I say seasons for the show, I mean just a round of interviews. I do them, then I take a break to record more and release those. So I do that over and over, and that's, so there's no real timeline for the seasons, it's just a group of interviews that I do. And each time I try to mix it up a little bit. All right, where was I? So the second season, I decided to personally go out and visit a lot of the galleries and the shops that people had mentioned on the show and find out more about them. So this second time around, I took a digital recorder with me and went and met the people face to face at the shops that they have. Then the season after that, I tried to meet people in person whenever I could. And then a strange thing happened. People even started contacting me from different parts of the United States. Since then, I got the chance to meet lots of people, publish my comics as a graphic novel. I started selling things at events and pop-ups. I got some press, some write-ups. My band Lorenzo's Music was even featured in Forbes, which was a very strange thing for a band to be in. So I've been working on continuing to try and do new things and not let life get comfortable again. And one way I'm doing that, I rented out a 1930s train car to use as a studio in a retail space. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. So as these episodes go along, I'm going to share with you what I'm trying to do and the multiple ways that I want to see if it's possible to just live a creative life of some sort. And part of that is going to involve trying to turn this train car into something. One of the things I've been trying to piece together is the different ways people have been selling what they make online. So I got together with a couple of artists that have been selling their own work online and asked more about how they manage it, how they ship the items and things like that. But recently I've been hearing a lot of people saying they're not happy with Etsy as one of the options anymore. And I wanted to know more about that since I've never really used Etsy before. I'm Kaylin Diekman. I own the Artistry Studio. It's a small part-time business that I put together as an artist. So I sell prints and artwork and all sorts of fun things that spark my interest. Kaylin was posting about how upset she was with Etsy and I saw that on Instagram and I thought I could ask her, see if she would meet me and I could get a first-hand account of what is going on with that site. Also, she brought along an artist friend that has actually been a big help to her along the way. I'm Heather Andreessen. I run Mississippi Mayhem. I'm an artist as well. I mainly do embroideries and paintings, and I'm starting to put out prints. First thing, when we got together, I wanted to know a little bit about what they both do as creators. Heather tells me that she has been getting inspiration from old movies. Recently, I was watching Frankenstein, you know, the old school one. I was like, I want to do a painting of this. And so I just got some really fun colors out of my paints and started painting. And um, now it's just turned into this whole series. I just finished The Creature from the Black Lagoon. I'm about to do The Mummy next. What prompted you to do the Universal Studios monster movie genre? I work at home, so when I'm in my studio, I'll watch movies and watch TV shows or listen to podcasts, so mm. that was just what I was watching that week. Okay. How did you get started? So I went to college for English, actually, because I thought, like, I can't make a job out of art. And then after I graduated college, I did minor in it, but I wasn't doing it anymore. And I finally got to that point where I was like, I need that creative outlet. And so I started making art again just for me. And then I was like, well, I have all this art. What am I going to do with it? So I decided, you know what? Let's open an Etsy shop. Let's try and sell my art and make a business out of it. And then I can spread my art out and I don't have to keep it in piles in my home. And other people can enjoy it as much too. And it helps me like stay calm and stay relaxed and keep that creative flow going rather than just ignoring it and setting it aside. 
like I was doing for a few years there. What made you finally decide to go, I'm going to try and sell this though? It was about a year or so after graduating college and I hadn't picked up a paintbrush in at least six months. And I was like realizing that I'm not happy anymore. Something's different and I miss it. And I realized it's, it's, I'm not making art. Mm. And I was like, why, why did I stop? I have all the stuff to do it. Why did I quit doing it? So I picked it up and I started painting and I started drawing and I started getting inspired by new things. And I decided, you know, this is what I was missing and I need to keep doing this. And then having a shop and selling my art became kind of a way to make me responsible for it and keep me doing it because now people are following me and people are watching and they want to see more. So it makes me want to do more. Mm. So it was just like a really good motivator for me. When they first met, they were doing an out of town art show in Milwaukee and they bonded over how they were kind of disappointed with the event. Did you guys know each other before that? We actually met <laughs> at an art show that we both ended up doing. And then we found out that we both lived in Madison. Oh. I had already started my Etsy, but it was a baby shop and it wasn't doing... Baby as in baby clothes? Or... Baby as in brand new. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, those exist. <laughs> That's so. true. It was, it was just a brand new shop and I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I hadn't worked my way into the craft fairs and the art show scene, really. Mm. I'd only done that one show. It's a fancier, upper scale art show. It was done at the Rave. We ended up... In deciding it probably wasn't our scene yeah and we bonded over that okay <laughs> and not to you know of course you don't want to poo-poo anybody's right. scene but what was the scene differentiation like you said not to denigrate them or anything like that but basically we had to pay a very large fee to get in uh, to the show it was close to 500 dollars. it was done on like a thursday night? it was a wednesday it was night. a wednesday night it was a weird night i had done shows before that um i don't think Kayden no had. i hadn't it was my first but you had to like sell a certain number of tickets or pay this 500 dollars to get in okay. and then like i said it was on a wednesday night so barely anybody showed up the only people who showed up were people who had friends in the show yeah i, mean, <laughs> I, I broke even but okay. i did not <laughs> Yeah. Cause, and I, because it was my first show, so I had a lot of prep to do prior to it. So I was making prints, and I was making a bunch of new paintings, and I was spending all this money to get my inventory up so I had enough for a show. And then hardly anyone was there to buy anything, especially bigger things, because here I was thinking, well, this is an art show, so people will want paintings. Mm -hmm. So I made some bigger paintings. I think you did, too. Yeah. No one was buying big paintings. Mm -hmm. Like, the only things I did sell were small things that people could, like, fit in their purse because they didn't seem to want to pay the big bucks or, I mean, I wasn't even selling things for high prices back then. Mm -hmm. I was selling things very, very cheaply because I didn't know what their worth was mm -hmm. and people just weren't interested. So it was kind of like a thing where when it was over and said and done, it was something that I wouldn't do again. If I were paying that much to be in a show, I know I'd like to make my money back. But aside from not knowing how much it costs for materials to create art, I've never been good at the next part, which would be how much should I even sell the stuff for? You even talked recently about learning about the worth of what you do. How did you come across like this is the cost? For me, it's Heather. It's all Heather. Okay. She all right. is my Explain husband. the secret for me, Heather. Please tell me. The secret is pay yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Right. But it's, it's a, it is a difficult thing to decide. I mean, it's not that we don't feel self-worth. It's that you feel bad asking people to also give you your self-worth. I don't know. Even as I'm saying it out loud, it sounds stupid. Oh, no. But yeah. It sounds stupid. <laughs> it, it makes total sense. I was totally there whenever I first started selling my art. I started looking at the market around me and what my costs were compared to other people's. And I looked at the median and... I just realized that I was undervaluing not only myself, but the market itself. Mm. And so... When you're bringing down other people's prices because you're not valuing yourself, that's not okay. And I mean, she's been drilling this into me for probably <laughs> a year now, and I finally have taken that step. I was slowly upping prices here and there, but it was finally to a point where, like, she made that Frankie painting, and mm -hmm. then she sold it, and she told me how much she sold it for, and I was like, wait, what? I'm undercharging then. <laughs> and so at that point, I was like, okay, I need to take a step back. I need to reevaluate. Are people willing to pay for this? Because... It's hard to value your own art. It's hard to say, hey, this is good. You should want to pay this for it mm -hmm. because it's yours and you're going to see every detail that is wrong. And I think it's important to just remember, like, everyone has their own style. Everyone does things differently. And just because yours doesn't look exactly like someone else's doesn't mean it should be any cheaper than theirs. Not only are you undervaluing your art, but then you're making their art seem like, well, why is there so expensive if this person is so cheap? Are they charging too much or is this other person's work not as good and that's why it's cheaper? 
So, mm-hmm. like, you have to look at it from all the different perspectives yeah. of what goes through a customer's brain when they're comparing pieces that they may want to buy. The thing is, you have to value your own time. Mm-hmm. You have to value your labor. You have to value your talent. Just because Kaylin can paint and I can paint doesn't mean that my customers are going to be her customers and they might value my work better than hers just because of their taste. Mm -hmm. So you just have to understand your own value is what it all boils down to. And the place that they started to find the value of what they made, like a lot of other people, was online with their own Etsy shops. When you guys started on Etsy, how did you get found? For me, uh, it was around 2007, 8, 9, somewhere in there. Okay. (laughs) And I was taking photographs, and I was living in Memphis at the time. Some of my friends and their friends had started buying my prints. So I was like, well, I'll just, you know, pop on over to Etsy and see how that goes. And I just put my prints on there, and they didn't sell. Nothing. Not a thing. So I just kind of let it sit there for about seven years. Mm -hmm. And in 2015, I think, yeah, 2015, I started doing embroidery again. My grandmother and my mother had taught me when I was a young child, but Mm -hmm. I picked it up again as an adult. And people wanted what I was doing because it was subversive. It wasn't the typical, you know, grandma cross stitch or embroidery. I had, you know, this following already on Instagram because I had made friends with these people or, and so they followed me over to Etsy. And from there, it's just become this thing of promotion. I don't think that a lot of people realize with art, you have to promote yourself. Um, Otherwise people aren't going to find you. When I first jumped in, I was posting on Instagram and I was posting on my listings on Etsy. And that was pretty much all I had. Mm-hmm. I had a Facebook, but I didn't really use it. And then I just kind of was like hoping for people to find my art and hopefully they would like it and they'd buy it. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't working. I wasn't making sales. I think the first three months I was on Etsy, I made maybe four sales and three of those were my friends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it wasn't like I was being found by people. And the first time I did get found by someone, I was like, oh my God, there's a person out there that likes my art. But that wasn't happening that frequently. Like some people say it is. And so then I started deciding, okay, well, maybe Instagram is what I need to be doing. And I started putting some more effort and time into my Instagram and trying to promote myself. Probably around the time I met Heather and we did that first show is when I really started going for it. And she introduced me to all these groups of people that she had connected with and all these members of different Facebook groups and Instagram groups who are each other's hype man, essentially, you know, they, they're there to like help your business and they have their own business and they understand your woes and your happy moments. And it's nice to have that community around you. Cause once you have that community, you get more confident in your posting. But like she said, social media is so important. If you don't do social media, you're not right. going to grow. End of story. Back when I first started following Kaylin on Instagram, I'd been seeing how she promoted the work that she did. And as I was checking out different online carts to experiment with, That's when I saw that she had started posting about how she was becoming increasingly disappointed with the new changes that Etsy was making for their site, as were a lot of people. But again, I had never used Etsy, so what is going on with the site? It was before the new year. Uh, They made a change to include a premium version of Etsy, Mm -hmm. where you pay extra to get extra features, or um, you get extra ad sales and you come up higher in SEO ranks Mm -hmm. when people are searching on Etsy for a specific item. But that was paid. So that was the first thing that kind of knocked everyone back. Like, wait, why do I have to pay to get in a higher search rank? Why can't my stuff come up at the same level as everyone else's? So essentially, by not signing up for it, you're just getting kicked down lower in the search results. Mm -hmm. Most recently, there have been rumors that they are going to start charging for well, not charging, the shipping. They're changing the way that shipping is going to be done. First, we heard that there was a survey going around that Etsy was going to have free shipping site-wide for $40. If someone spent $40, it didn't matter if they shopped in one shop or 10, they would get free shipping for all their items. And then someone else had a survey that said it was $35. And this was about... mm, three or four weeks after that first survey had come out. So first of all, they're already being insulting with the $40. Then they're dropping it three to four weeks later to 35 Say someone spent $30 in Kaylin's shop. Mm -hmm. Then they came to my my shop and they spent $5. I would have to send my item out for free 
despite the fact that she got the bulk of the money. And so it's we'd not both, okay. <laughs> we both ship for free. And more than likely, in my case, it wouldn't affect me too much because they did spend $30 in my shop. Mm-hmm. But say the $5 I spent in her shop, it cost her $4 to ship it. Well, now she made a dollar. Mm-hmm. But that's not even putting into effect how much she spent to make the product. Or the listing fee. Or the other fees that Etsy... Yeah, because Etsy also takes yeah. a percentage of your sales. Yeah. So, and the shipping. And the shipping now, which was rolled out. I thought this is what it was like, and this is my outrage with it. So I'm familiar with, music-wise, with Bandcamp. Everybody loves Bandcamp, and they're like, oh, it's great. It's for indie people. And just like Etsy, it's like, oh, it's all handmade. Yes. But if you actually use it, they start doing stuff like this, and it's like, you wouldn't exist if we didn't put our stuff on there. You know, like, the fact that they restrict it to handmade, like, if they just did eBay and you can sell whatever the hell you wanted there, then, like, okay, that would make sense. But seriously, you're making your own stuff, and they're saying you can and can't do this. It's not like you're going, I bought, I went to a flea market and bought... 20 pounds of Kleenex and that's what I'm selling. Just like with Bandcamp, the whole thing is, is we're going to take a cut of your sales, but we're going to open up our API and invite all these developers to use our platform to build their own music app and your music gets used for free and we don't pay you for streaming. But you can sell your stuff if you want on our site, but all these other developers are building stuff. There's a weird, like they're working with people to make money on their side, but if you weren't there, you wouldn't, they wouldn't exist. Okay, sorry, I get worked up when I talk about Bandcamp. It's it's one of those necessary evils like iTunes. It's where people go to buy stuff because it's known by its name and what it's for. Just like Etsy. As we were talking, they mentioned shipping costs. And I'd never thought really what it's like to ship a painting if people order it. Do you guys do a lot of shipping? Do you ship out? I guess I don't know how much you sell locally and how much you sell nationally. Most of my sales are national or international. My sales are probably... Nowadays, it's ranging more towards national, too. I don't make as many sales as Heather does, but I do still. I'm at the post office at least every week shipping things out. So pretty regularly. I feel like whenever I actually do sell something, it's like, oh, mad scatter to figure out how to box this thing. It was a nightmare. When I first started, I was like, (laughs) what am I doing? Like learning the post office system was hard Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you get there and you're like, okay, I have this. I want to ship. And then they have all their rules Mm -hmm. that you have to follow to make sure you ship it properly. So making sure you don't lose money on shipping was a big thing. Well, I made ornaments over Christmas. Glass. That's a nightmare to ship. Yeah. Yeah. I was terrified. (laughs) I was terrified. So I was mostly trying to get people to buy them locally at like shops I did, but I did sell them online and I did have some people buy them. I had the person in Canada buy one of my ornaments and I was terrified that it wasn't going to get to Canada in one piece because it's glass and it's thin. What I ended up doing is I ended up getting some thicker, higher quality boxes off. I think it was Uline on on the internet, just searching boxes. I bought them. I bought a bunch of bubble wrap and I bubble wrapped as tight into the box as I could. And Mm -hmm. then I sealed it up and I had my fiance pitch it at a wall. (laughs) And That's actually pretty genius. Yeah. I filmed it, put it on my Instagram stories and everything. But yeah, I packaged it up as best as I thought I could. And I said, here, chuck it at the wall as hard as you can Mm -hmm. and let's test it. And it worked. So luckily, and the one that made it to Canada, it was actually shipping to a friend of mine. When she got it, she's like, yeah, it was pretty badly bruised up. Like the box had bent corners and stuff, but it made it safe. Yeah. So it's trial and error. (laughs) Like I did a lot of researching on just Google trying to figure out how do you ship your artwork and you'll find suggestions here and there but you also just kind of find what works for you I find that bubble wrap and cardboard for stability is like the best thing you can do and then I use rigid mailers for all my prints so that they can't get bent I did have one print get bent once and I felt awful so rigid mailers that's my go-to for those I don't really know what that is what is a rigid mail Uh, it's like an envelope you would send like legal documents in but they make thicker ones out of cardboard oh okay and so they're they're not I guess I didn't know they were called that okay yeah they're called rigid mailers alright I'm learning terminology from you guys this is awesome (laughs) if you Amazon search it that's what you look for if they were going to leave Etsy what other online carts were they going to use instead it turns out Kaylin already made the switch Kaylin's already made her leap. (laughs) I went very (laughs) gung-ho. I got mad at Etsy and I decided, you know what? I'm doing this now. And I gave myself, I think, two or three weeks. I chose Shopify. And I think that was my best choice because it made it pretty easy. I was able to transfer all of my listings over. I just had to tweak them once I got them into the new system and like adjust things inventory and things like that. It let you import the yeah. stuff. Oh, that's it nice. You, Etsy isn't all bad. They will let you export some things. They'll let you export all of your listings, but they don't let you export like everything. Okay. So 
I did that and I made the switch and I set up my site. And the best thing about Shopify is that it gives you so much more freedom to do what you want with your site. It treats it like it's a CMS and a website yeah. from what I've seen in my experience. And it allows you to customize everything to your taste and your needs and what you want for your shop. Like I was able to add a blog into my page mm -hmm. and I was able to add a whole separate page about commissions, which I couldn't do that on Etsy because yeah. Etsy has a very rigid template. This is what your shop is going to look like. Mm -hmm. You get to fix these tiny little things, like you can arrange the pictures on the front page, but that's it. And you're only allowed so many categories of product and they cap you at 20 and then you're done. And if you have something else you want to list, well, then you have to delete a different category and add it. And Shopify doesn't do that to you. Shopify lets yeah. you keep going. And I went through and I did the math. <laughs> Our friends, we have a group chat and <laughs> one day we decided, hey, uh, let's play a fun game. Let's see how much money we spent per month to Etsy last year. Oh. So we went into our reports for Etsy Diagnostics, mm -hmm. and I found like my yearly total, because you can search and sort by the year. I found my yearly total for last year, divided it by 12, and it turned out I was sp spending $60 a month to Etsy, like listing fees and the percentage they take from sales, the percentage they are taking from shipping. Okay. And so I did that math, and I was like, well, why am I still here then? Because mm -hmm. Shopify, the most basic plan, you can get for $29 a month. And that's if you're paying month to month. Yeah, and that's if you're paying month to month. If you pay by year, it's even cheaper. So it was at that point I was like, I'm done with Etsy. Let's do this. Let's move. Let's do something better for my shop and give myself the ability to do exactly what I want with it. Because mm -hmm. I don't want my shop just to be, well, here, buy my art. I want my shop to be like, here, learn about me as a person. And here's my blog. And here's where I talk about things. And Making new content as far as like putting blogs and stuff on there, that makes your page get indexed. And that's what keeps it getting checked. If it's just cart stuff that doesn't move that you send people to, it just goes, oh, well, this hasn't changed in like 30 days, so we're just going to index it as that. If you start writing more stuff on there and writing about rele relevant stuff, then it's going to be, oh, this is a site for, you know, whatever you're selling there mm -hmm. or for painting or for earrings or for jewelry or whatever, as long as you're writing about it. Heather took a little more time looking for her online cart. So what are you leaning towards? Well, I wasn't quite blind leap of faith. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I am a very logical person and I like to research. So I did tons of research yeah. before I chose and I actually chose Shopify as well. So oh, I made okay. the right choice. Yeah, right. she did. <laughs> what are some of the other places that you looked at? I'm curious. God, everything. I think I looked at at least 14 different oh, yeah. sites. It was Shopify, Wix, Big Cartel. Squarespace. Uh, Squarespace. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's one that starts with an M. It's normally... Uh, Magento. Yeah. Yeah. That one. I looked at everything from the whole spectrum, and Shopify, for me, is the most cost-effective and offers the most quality, I guess. Yeah. There's one out there that I found very intriguing, but I ended up not pursuing. It was called... And it also had a horrible name. It was called Equid. It's an up-and-comer, and they're really like going gung-ho, and it's they're, they're throwing so much functionality at it to the point where, much like what Shopify does at their cheapest level, you can actually create a cart, take the items, and then embed them on your own site. So even if you already have a website, you don't have to go, okay, now go over here to my cart. You can embed it in there. It's very seamless, and I was actually really impressed with it. I actually haven't made a decision yet. It's really it, is. Tough. it really is. Yeah, I've gone back and forth. I mean, right now I'm just using Big Cartel because it's hooked up, and I'm like, well, it's working, and in the meantime, it's like, well, I suppose that's okay. So you're moving to Shopify. Again, I guess that comes down to how much how much volume do you guys move? Like how much stuff do you guys actually sell? I've always tried to keep my listings above a hundred mm -hmm. because people like to see variety. Mm -hmm. And now I have over two hundred listings just because of the volume of work that I've amassed. But Where do you keep it? I have a studio in you do. my apartment, yeah. Okay. With a Stupidly large closet. <laughs> oh, nice. All <laughs> yeah. right. Um, but as for how much output, I think that in the past two weeks I've had like 35 orders. So that's a lot of trips to the post office. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have it like they don't come to your door and you don't do the whole stamps.com thing or whatever. Maybe if I had like 35 orders in a day, a day <laughs> I would do that. But I feel like that's such a small amount that I can just do it myself. And the thing is too, like with Etsy, you could do Etsy shipping labels where all, it prints it all off. You're done. You're good. You don't have to speak with the person at the post office. You yeah. could just drop it off, but they still don't give you discounts for doing that. It's You're still paying the same, if not maybe a little bit more for the shipping labels that you would if you go to the post office. What's nice about Shopify though, is Shopify just being a member, they give you a discount on shipping. 
labels. So it's like, I think they said anywhere to 60% ship, like shipping discounts. Mm -hmm. So it's actually cheaper to like print your labels that way. So now that I'm on Shopify, I can go and print off a shipping label for a discount cheaper Mm -hmm. than I would at the post office, stick it on there. And then I can just drop it off at the post office and not even have to go up to a desk. So it, it eliminates the, the wait time at the post office, especially depending on the time of day because it gets crazy. I had an experience recently. So I've been selling collectibles. It's one thing I've been doing to kind of subsidize costs on stuff. I made the mistake going to the post office. It's been years since I've had to ship anything. And I was like, hey, do you have a box you can put this in? It's like a collectible I sold for like 100 bucks. It's an action figure. And she's like, well, she takes it and she's like, if we fold it like this and she like, I'm like, I just sold that for 100 bucks. And she's like, oh, is this like a collectible or something? And I'm like, it was. All right. I clearly have not gotten over that post office experience. I even talked about it on my daily comic when it happened. One thing I wanted to point out is previously when I met people on the podcast, they told me that because of the number of individual items that they make, they usually only offer a few items for sale online because of that. Which I always found surprising because I always try to take full advantage of the online marketplace. But I'm a web developer, so that's just a normal place for me to gravitate to. When hearing Heather say that she lists between 100 to 200 different items, that is pretty impressive as an individual artist. And on top of all this, since they were selling things online, I was curious what they think interested people about the work that they do. Why do you think people buy your stuff? What do you think appeals to them? It's hard to describe to people what kind of art you do in the first place. So when people actually buy it, do you ever wonder like, hey, what attracted you to what I make? And uh, have you gotten any answers for that? Doing shows and getting to know people in person has helped a lot with knowing why people enjoy my art. And I think a lot of it is that they kind of see that it's really corny, but they kind of see that like kindred spirit in Mm -hmm. my art. A lot of my art is very irreverent or brightly colored and sarcastic and kind of just badass. Offbeat, (laughs) Offbeat, definitely offbeat, (laughs) quirky, all terms that I would use to describe it. And Mm -hmm. I think that they see that in themselves and they see it in my art and they, it speaks to them. So when they have that in their home, they can see it every day and it makes them happy. It's the same for me. I have a couple of really amazing customers and friends now, really, because I have people who come back to my shop and they continue buying things. And I like to describe my art as bold color and good vibes. Like I have a lot of things that has inspirational quotes and like happy, make you feel good kind of things. But I also almost never paint something the colors it should be painted. Mm. <laughs> like I'll do a landscape and I'll paint the sky pink and yellow and purple and it will never, um, almost never be blue because I just like the use of color and that's what catches my eye. And I think that my customers and the people who are buying my art are also people who just enjoy that brightness and something like spark up a space. Yeah. And it's really cool getting like reviews and or comments from people. And when they say, I love looking at that every morning, Mm -hmm. it's just, it's something so nice that makes you want to just keep doing it and never stop because you're making someone else's day better too. If you would like to find out more about Kaylin and the Artistry Studio, visit theartistrystudio.net. And if you would like to know more about Heather, you can find her on Instagram at Heather Leanne. If you're enjoying this podcast, head on over to my site at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe, where you can sign up for the mailing list. And it also has all the links to all the other things I'm doing online. Or let me know if you have any questions or you'd like to contact me about something. That's AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. The music for the show is by my band, Lorenzo's Music. So thanks for listening. And until the next episode, so long.